Chisomes are important structures within which strain can be localised in the crust. In some senses, they can be viewed as the ductile equivalent of faults. Their wall walks have experienced relative movement, charting displacement on the shear zones. The continuous strain patterns in shear zones can be analysed not only to explore the localisation of deformation in the crust, but also to estimate the bulk displacements across these zones. The strain can be charted using the orientation of the shape fabrics created during shearing and also by the orientations of pre-existing markers as they deflect in and out of shear zones. And if we quantify shear strain across a shear zone, we can then calculate the shear zone's displacement. But before embarking on this, if shear zones can be considered to be faults, we can simply measure the offset of a marker along a shear zone if our objective is simply to quantify displacement. So this spectacular outcrop in the Swiss Alps contains a shear zone. Here it is, the zone of intense deformation. We can see that that pale applite band has been offset in the sense picked out by the arrows. So the shear zone has moved down and to the right. So to find the displacement, we just see where the applite intersects the hanging wall and the foot wall of our shear zone and measure the displacement along the shear zone itself. So very quickly, we can quantify the displacement as long as we can correlate a marker such as this applite across the shear zone. But if we do this, then we're not getting much information about what's going on in the shear zone itself. For that, we need to look at the strain. So let's start off thinking about shear strain. So in these simple diagrams, the shear plane is running horizontally in the diagram, and we're moving the top blocks over to the right. The middle block is experiencing the shear strain. The shear strain is gamma. Now, a pre-existing marker that is orthogonal to the shear plane deflects over to the right, opening up an angle phi. And gamma, the shear strain, is simply the tangent of that angle. The displacement is gamma, the shear strain, multiplied by the width across the shear zone, here labelled distance. So displacement is equal to distance multiplied by the shear strain. What this relationship means is that essentially what we're doing is erecting a profile across the shear zone, measuring the shear strain along this profile, plotting the shear strain against distance across profile and then integrating that curve and that gives us the displacement. In this simple cartoon we have an abrupt shear zone margin top and base and a single value for shear strain in it so that the graph is a simple step function. Natural shear zones are more complicated. Now let's have a look at how we can quantify shear strain using offset markers. On this outcrop, we've got two markers. We've got the big fat white applite zone coming across the middle, we've already discussed, and there's another little one in here which just about crosses the shear zone. Neither marker is perfectly orthogonal to the shear zone. So let's generalize the solution to quantifying shear strain for markers of different orientations. So let's consider just this blue marker, which enters the shear zone from the base, deflects over to the right and then exits further right again, betraying the top to the right shearing. Now, this pre-existing marker makes an orientation relative to the shear plane outside the shear zone of alpha. And as it goes into the shear zone, this blue marker deflects over, making a new angle alpha prime. Let's set up some trigonometry. On this diagram, the shear plane is horizontal, and we're saying that our original marker makes an angle alpha to the shear plane. If we set this box up as a unit box, then that distance along the top is the cotangent of alpha. So this is the orientation of our marker outside the shear zone with respect to the shear plane. Let's deform it top to the right here. So here is our shear plane in the same orientation and our marker has been deflected towards the shear plane so that the angle alpha has changed to alpha prime. 
and alpha prime is that distance marked out along the shear plane at the top of our diagram. So what is cot alpha prime? Cot alpha prime is equal to the distance of cot alpha plus the extra bit that's been added to it because of the imposed shear strain gamma. So cot alpha prime is equal to gamma plus cot alpha. So we need to know the orientation of the shear plane. If we know that, we can measure alpha, the orientation of our feature outside the shear zone, and we can also measure alpha prime, the orientation of that feature relative to the shear plane in the shear zone. We know alpha prime and alpha, so therefore we can find the shear strain gamma. We can then simply apply that to our relationship we looked at just now by multiplying gamma by the width of the shear zone, the distance term, little d, and that gives us displacement. So I have a method now for establishing the shear strain for pre-existing markers that are deflected into the shear zone, provided we know the original orientation of that feature, which we may be able to measure outside the shear zone. So in our example on the left, we could make that sort of estimate. We can see these aplite veins, which are quasi straight outside the shear zone, and we can measure their orientations and therefore compare their orientations outside the shear zone with their deformed orientations in the shear zone. But many shear zones don't have pre-existing markers crossing them. So in these situations, what about using the fabric that defines the shear zone alone? So these are new shape fabrics, such as we see on the right. So let's look at this. Here we have a simple before and after for a shearing of a square with a circle in it. So the circle becomes an ellipse. The long axis of the ellipse is the orientation of the foliation. And that is making an angle with respect to the shear plane of theta. And here's the trigonometry that relates theta to the shear strain gamma. And we can plot these simply on here. So rather than do with that rather clumsy expression, we can simply just read off the values from this graph, which was developed by John Ramsey in the 1960s. Remember that this shape fabric will initiate at 45 degrees to the shear plane and then swing in to become parallel with the shear plane. So as the deformation continues, the angle between the foliation and the shear plane decreases, as you can see in the graph. So we've got two methods now for quantifying shear strain to find displacement. We can use the new foliation and we can use deflected pre-existing markers. But we still have to do one more thing. These methods rely on making measurements of either the pre-existing marker or the new shape fabric relative to the shear plane. But if we look on the photograph, there's no label on it that says I am a shear plane, we need to be able to establish the shear plane orientation. So let's consider what the shear plane is. The shear plane is the plane into which the long axis of our shape fabric is attempting to rotate. As you can see in this cartoon, the shear plane here runs horizontally and with increasing deformation into the center of our shear zone, as the ellipticity increases, the long axis of the ellipse is decreasing, so it's converging with the horizontal lines in the diagram. So this is the orientation of the shear plane. In practice, then, how do we get that? So let's go stepwise through the analysis of a shear zone. Stage one, find the shear plane. And we're looking at a shear zone defined by new foliation. We're going to construct isogons on this new foliation. An isogon is simply a contour of equal value of angle. So set up a reference direction. This is entirely arbitrary. It does not have to be north-south. It can be any orientation you like, as long as it's fixed. And we're going to measure the orientation of foliations with respect to this reference direction. So here's some foliation that is making an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the reference direction. Now we need to find some other foliations along the shear zone 
with this same orientation of 45 degrees with respect to the reference direction. Here we go. So this is an isogon of 45 degrees. Now let's do it again for another orientation of foliation. Let's say here where the foliation makes an angle of 65 degrees relative to our reference direction. And again, we can draw up the isogon for 65. So here we have two isogons, one of the value 65, one of the value 45. Let's just be clear, these values 65 and 45 have no structural significance because we've measured these angles relative to an arbitrary reference direction. However, the pattern of isogons is very much of significance because these are values of equal orientation of the foliation, therefore of equal strain. We've yet to work out what that strain is, but it's equal strain. These are contours that are parallel to the shear plane. So in this view, our shear plane runs east-west. So we want to construct our profile perpendicular to the shear plane in this orientation like this. What we're going to do is along this trend is measure the orientation of the foliation relative to the shear plane. And we can then plot that up in a profile of shear strain against distance across the shear zone. We're going to use this graph because we're using the new shape fabric, the new foliation, so we can just measure the orientation of the foliation relative to the shear plane and read off what the shear strain is and then plot it as we go. And here is the result. So now we just have to construct the profile by joining up the dots. So we get a curve through the data and integrate it to find the total displacement. However, just think about what we've done here. This line joining the dots varies in shear strain value between the dots. Therefore, it implies that the shear strain varies continuously through the shear zone. If you look at the diagram though, it's been built with straight line segments that you might draw by tracing point to point on an outcrop photograph. Regardless of how it was done, the straight line segments tell us that the shear strain in those segments is constant. Therefore, the shear strain profile should not be a continuous curve, but a step function, like this. So actually, this is quite a good way to work. By dividing the shear zone profile into a series of segments or domains within which you fit a straight line, to represent the orientation of the shape fabric of the foliation, you can then very quickly plot the graph. And that is a very easy thing to integrate to find the total displacement, as you can see on the diagram. It's also a more accurate approach than trying to fit a curve. By accurate, I mean it's going to give you a better total displacement value. The integration will be more accurate. It might not tell you quite so much about how strain is localised. It's telling you nothing at all about what, how strain is localising within individual domains or these segments. But certainly it gives an impression across the shear zone itself. In here we can see that the highest shear strain, a value of 3, is in the core of the shear zone and that the shear strain drops away to the margins of the shear zone. So we're learning something about localization. The study of shear strain across shear zones may be a rather elegant piece of structural geology, but if you're simply after the displacement, then being able to correlate markers across shear zones and simply measuring displacement is a quick, simple and accurate way to go. This is rather like considering the shear zone to be a single domain, linking back to that previous diagram. But the direct measurement approach does not inform discussions of strain localization. For this we need to quantify the strain pattern in the shear zone. We've seen how we can use new fabrics from the aligned minerals that define a shape fabric. And we've also looked at the deflection of pre-existing markers 
both of which can be used to quantify the shear strain and to plot profiles of shear strain across shear zones. Yes, we can use those to find displacement by integrating them, but we can also explore and quantify the patterns of strain localization in deformed rocks.